Well, last time we, uh, we did get around to chapter 8, but we spent the majority of the night looking at some symbolic aspects of the high priesthood and the priesthood as they relate to ourselves as believers in everything. There's really a lot of symbolism uh, in, in the scriptures, but certainly in this book of Hebrews. And uh, we're going to touch on that again tonight as we go through chapter 9. So Hebrews chapter 9, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you would open up, as was prayed earlier, the eyes of our heart. Open our understanding to just the marvelous truths that are here in front of us as we look at uh, the earthly tabernacle and sacrificial system in contrast to that which is heavenly, Lord. Uh, may just our our uh, understanding of Christ and what he's done for us grow, our love for him grow. May we learn um, what it means uh, to worship, which means to uh, give to one who is worthy that which is due to them, Lord, and that we might be uh, those who worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would show us what that means and empower us to live in a manner that is in agreement with that. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as we move into chapter 9, the author continues to develop the contrast between the Old and the New Covenant, which was kind of the topic of the last part of chapter 8, and the contrast between the earthly and the heavenly. That's been a theme running through this as we've looked at the superiority of of Christ is our high priest, the superiority of his sacrifice, the uh, superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant of uh, angels, uh, all, all those things that we've we've been seeing. And so by way of reminder, let's read a, a few verses in chapter 8, first verses 4 through 6. So he says there, the author says there, for if he, speaking of Jesus, were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, God said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is a, also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Down in verse 7, it says, uh, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And then finally in Hebrews uh, 8, 12 verse, uh, verses 12 through 13, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lost, lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old uh, is uh, ready to vanish away. So with these statements in mind, we want to head into chapter 9 and, and look at, at how he continues this, this contrast. Uh, and first uh, part of Hebrews 9, uh, we see some features of the Old Covenant. Uh, first, the tabernacle and furnishings of the Old Covenant, uh, verses 1 through 5. Then, indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that held the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So when he speaks here of the first covenant, he's speaking, as we noted last time, of the Mosaic or the Sinaitic covenant. Details uh, of which are, of course, revealed in the Old Testament. That phrase, ordinances of divine service, in, in other words, we might say regulations for worship. Isn't that what all of those ordinances were really about how God would be worshipped. You know, the, the, 
uh, setting up and tearing down of the tabernacle, the moving of the tabernacle, the uh, various sacrifices that were offered, the uh, you know trimming of the lampstand, and uh, all of those things pertain to worship of God. So regulations for worship, and when we read that word service here in the book of Hebrews, what we want to think of is worship. Because if we do that, it's going to help us understand what the author is talking about. God prescribed to Israel regulations with respect to how he was to be worshipped, and the service of worship was conducted through the agency of priests. We want to remember a really important principle. From worship comes service. It should never be the other way around. Uh, as we truly enter into the place of being those who worship God, Service will be the outflow. Anything other than that is religion. And, you know, so the question comes up, you know, you, you all often hear in a church, it's 10% of the people that do 90% of the work and, and all of that. So what's the real issue? People not being drawn into worship or allowing themselves to be drawn into worship for one reason or another. When we truly worship, and now our word worship is tied to the word worthy. And so it, it, it's giving to one who is worthy that, that honor, that, wor that respect, that worship that, that is appropriate uh, for, for their worth, if you will. And, and God is certainly worthy of our worship in, in worshiping him with everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we want to be, will be, all of that. Everything belongs to God. He's He's do everything. We talked about how we've been bought with a price. We're no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And, and, and that certainly would enter into this, this idea. From worship comes service. Religion is the work of man's hands in an attempt to cover his sin in order to approach God. The very first act of religion in a, a negative connotation or uh, an act of religion, uh, apart from relationship with Christ, uh, w we find in the book of Genesis, uh, when Adam and Eve uh, ate of the forbidden fruit, discovered their uh, nakedness and tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. That's the very first act of worship on the part of mankind. And God did wasn't adequate, was it? Um, there was no shedding of blood. There was no death. The wages of sin is death. And so God himself made them a covering with uh, e evidently some animal skins, probably of a lamb. Um, we see here that the author launches into two aspects of the first covenant. The first covenant had ordinances of divine service, as we're told, and the earthly sanctuary. sanctuary uh, and he addresses these in reverse order. First, he speaks of the earthly sanctuary in verses 2 through 5 <clears throat> and then of the regulations for worship in verses 6 through 10. The earthly uh, sanctuary is speaking of the tabernacle uh, which also was a model of the temple later on so you can kind of in one sense see them in, in, in a synonymous sense but but really what's in view here is that tabernacle uh, literally the the tent that uh, Moses made. Uh, and uh, so uh, that earthly sanctuary, speaking of the tabernacle, uh, remember God gave Moses very detailed specifications for its construction. And we looked at that last time, what materials to use, the dimensions to make it, uh, how to build it, uh, how to transport it, how to set it up, how to tear it down, and just really great detail. And he came down from the mountain with those the same time that he brought the uh, the uh, uh, Ten Commandments on the tablet. In fact, uh, listening to Chuck Missler, he says he likes to uh, tongue-in-cheek suggest that Cecil B. DeMille missed it when he made the Ten Commandments because Moses should have had a, uh, uh, you know, on one hand the Ten Commandments, the tablet, uh, on which were the Ten Commandments, and the other hand the, uh, the, the detailed specs for the tabernacle. <laughs> <laughs> what have you. So, but he had those. He, he came down with those. Now, uh, it was an earthly sanctuary planned by God 
but for an earthly service. We will perhaps look at more detail uh, uh, concerning the, the tabernacle and the ways that it foreshadows the, the person and ministry of Christ. Um, maybe next time, I'm not 100% sure we're going to go that direction, but, but I'm, I'm praying about it. But for now, we'll just make some simple observations as we sort of get a, a, a basic exposition of, of the chapter. Hopefully, we'll get all the way through the chapter. So the author speaks of two divisions or compartments of the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle, and literally it is the Hebrew word that means tent. And that first tabernacle was just that, a tent, right? Of, you know, skins that, that, that form the, the, uh, at least the outer walls and, and the roof and, and everything. Uh, so uh, it was not a large building. In fact, it was relatively small. It was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. And, and while not mentioned here, it sat in a fenced off enclosure that was referred to as the court. <clears throat> Verse 2 says, For the tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. The first part of the tabernacle was called the, the holy place. Uh, it was never entered into by the people, only by the priest in their daily ministrations uh, on behalf of the people before God. Uh, and in, in, inside that, that first compartment, the holy place, were actually three pieces of furniture, though only two are mentioned here. Uh, that compartment was 30 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. And it contained the lampstand with the, the seven bowls. Remember the center stem with six branches uh, for the oil to burn in and provide light. In fact, that was the only light inside uh, the, the sanctuary or the tabernacle, at least from a, an earthly, you know, material or source. Obviously, when God's Shekinah glory showed up in the, in, in the Holy of Holies, that was a, a pillar of fire by night and, and cloud by day. I'm, I'm sure there was some visible light from the glory of God um, uh, there in the Holy of Holies. But as far as uh, any source of light that was placed in there uh, uh, apart from God's presence, uh, it was only this this uh, uh, lampstand. And then there was the table <clears throat> on which the showbread was placed. And we're going to get to the third piece, which is not mentioned uh, in this verse, though it was uh, uh, actually located in that compartment in a moment as we move into the next section, verses 3 through 5. And behind the second veil, there was a, a first veil, which was the door into the holy place. And then the second uh, veil, which separated the holy place from the, the holiest of all. And so, uh, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So this second compartment, uh, here called the holiest of all, it's also called the holy of holies. And its dimensions were 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. I never, I don't recall ever hearing this, but seeing those dimensions spelled out that way, I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know if this is right or not, but this is the unique place where God's glory dwelt, right? The, uh, so could this, uh, these three dimensions being equal, uh, be an allusion to the Trinity, one God and three persons? Kind of interesting, huh? It really jumped off at me when I typed in 15 by 15 by 15. So is there, there's way more in this than perhaps we might see or understand all the time. So possibly a, an, a, an allusion, if you will, to the Trinity. And uh, it was separated by, uh, from the holy place by a, a very thick veil or curtain. Now, in this compartment, the priest, nor the people, they never entered. Only the high priest, and that not daily, where the priest went into the first compartment every day. Seven days a week, all the time. Uh, uh, the, the priest themselves never went into the second compartment. And only the high priest went in there, and that, not daily, but only 
on one day out of each year, the, the Yom Kippur, the, the Day of uh, Atonement. And actually, his ministrations in there on that day, he went in three separate times. Uh, so you can look at Leviticus and, and you know, sort of go through that yourselves. But uh, uh, now in that compartment were only two pieces of furniture, though three are mentioned. The first one, three pieces of furniture, and only two were mentioned. Here we see there were only two pieces of furniture, but three were mentioned. What's going on? <laughs> so we'll, we'll try to draw something out of that in a minute. So the first uh, piece of furniture that's mentioned with respect to this uh, uh, Holy of Holies is here called the Golden Censer. Uh, and... and there's a fair amount of debate about this verse. The two main views are, one is that it refers to a golden censer used once a year by the high priest when he enters the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and is linked to Leviticus 16, verse 12. I'll read that verse. Then he shall take, speaking of the high priest, a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. That altar is not the altar of incense but actually the altar that's outside in the court where the animals were sacrificed. Um, at least that's my understanding, and, and uh, all the commentators seem to agree with that. Uh, and with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. That incense would have been what was offered on the altar of incense there in the holy place. So, uh, with this view, there's no real evidence for the existence of this golden censer. Certainly we read of censers, um, uh, you know, the uh, 250 brought, you know, in, in the uh, rebellion of uh, uh, Dathan and Abiram and all that. They, uh, at one point, they Moses had them bring 250 censers before the Lord. We saw um, uh, Aaron's two sons uh, with censers and they offered profane fire before the Lord and were consumed and and so the censers were something that were used in, in with you know respect to the the tabernacle surface if you will but we don't specifically read of a golden censer that was used by the high priest for this purpose and it certainly didn't reside inside the holy of holies the second view is that this is a, re a reference to the golden altar of incense itself. It's called the golden altar of, of uh, incense. And if you look at the New American Standard, I think the New Living, uh, the English Standard Version, all the uh, versions uh, or translations of the Bible that aren't tied to the King James, translate it uh, as the, the golden altar of incense. Um, And that's the direction I lean personally. I think as I explored all the comments and uh, not a lot of arguments, but some of the technical arguments, I think that's the best conclusion personally. And you can explore it for yourself. Um, but those are the two major views. We're going to come back to that again in a moment. <clears throat> Secondly, located in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of, of the Testimony or uh, the Ark of the Covenant, as it's sometimes called, uh, inside of which were three items, a golden pot or jar containing some of the manna from which God supplied uh, as food for Israel during the 40 years of the wilderness wandering, uh, which is amazing, right? Because remember, if they kept it, yeah, they were to go out every day and gather it. And, and uh, if they kept it overnight to save some for the next day, it rotted and stank and, and everything, all except for on the the evening before the Sabbath, and it would be good for two days? Well, God has evidently preserved a sample of that, you know, indefinitely, if you will, or at least while it was in the Ark of the Covenant, um, wherever that might be or, or what have you. So very interesting. Also, Aaron's rod that budded, by which God confirmed Aaron was uh, his chosen uh, as uh, to be a priest, or, or, you know, and his descendants as being the, the line of priest and him specifically being the first high priest. And, and that was uh, uh, related to that rebellion, again, instigated by Korah, Dathan, and, and all of that. And, you know, Korah and company. 
And then thirdly, the tablet containing the Ten Commandments. They were all placed inside uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Now remember, the Ark of the Covenant was a chest made out of wood, specifically acacia wood, we're told, a, a special kind of wood. And it was overlaid, as we're told here, with gold inside and out. And it had a lid. And while we're tempted to view them as one piece of furniture, uh, Scripture treats them separately. This third piece of furniture that's mentioned here, even though only two of them actually uh, in the Old Testament were seen to reside inside the Holy of Holies, is the mercy seat, that, that lid for the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and it was made with the design of cherubim on top of it, like two statues where their wings were, were, were touching and uh, kind of intriguing. Now, he then says at the end of verse 5, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. As we noted in our own opening statement, quoting from Hebrews 8, all these things foreshadowed or were pictures, models uh, of spiritual truths that uh, po they pointed to greater things. And, and that's the point we wanted to make, because as we look at these, well, that's some of you know what we want to understand or draw from. The author identifies the main articles of interest but he says that they contain so many pictures, he doesn't have time at this point to detail all of them. That's exciting to me. That means there's a lot for us to discover as we look at these Old Testament passages and also where they're quoted in the New Testament and begin to see Christ because everything points to Christ, right? We have already mentioned that the tabernacle in great detail, a detailed study of the tabernacle, uh, the, those, those detailed plans that God gave Moses in the book of Exodus is one of the neatest studies I've ever been through. And uh, I don't know if we still have the, the, the CD available or not. I'd, I'd have to ask Chuck. But uh, at one point we had gone through that detail, took several nights on a Wednesday night to go through it. And it absolutely fascinating. But let's just look a few, uh, you know, there, there's so much here. The author says he can't go into them, but let's look at, at a few of them, or a, a few things about a, a few of them. First, we have the lampstand. On one hand, it represents Jesus, who is the light of the world, right? That seems pretty obvious. But it, on the other, we see in that center stem, a picture of Jesus with the six branches coming out from it uh, as a picture of man, six being the number of man. Isn't it interesting uh, that, that we, we talked about this last time, but it's, that's a picture, if you will, of that we're to be abiding in Christ. The, uh, the, the, the six are abiding in the one. That's the way the, the lampstand is constructed. And we saw in the book of Revelation that the lampstands also represented the church. It's interesting that Jesus said at one point that he, I am the light of the world, right? But he also calls you and I, believers, the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Wow. So we get to share light, share truth about the living God. It's part of our, our great commission, part of our ministry, part of what the church is. It, it, we're light bearers, if you will. We share in that ministry after a manner with Jesus. So, wow, already there's there's a lot of symbolism, a lot of model or, or picture foreshadowing going on. Uh, since we are a kingdom of priests, by the way, we see a link between the old covenant ordinances or, uh, of service and that of the new, right? Who went into the holy place? Not the people, the priests. We're a kingdom of priests and they trimmed the, they put oil in and trimmed the, the lampstand, changed the wicks and everything, right? That's part of our ministry as part of the church. And so you, you begin to see there's layer and after layer after layer of symbolism if, if we begin to look. Then the table with the showbread on it is a picture of fellowship with God. There were 12 loaves of bread, one for each tribe, that were placed on that table. And, and so it's a picture of the nation's fellowship with God. Uh, our fellowship uh, with with Christ and, and what have you. 
let's see here. Then the third piece of furniture in, in, in the, the part of the tabernacle, uh, the holy place, was the altar of incense. The smoke of that incense being identified with the prayer of the saints, right? What is interesting here is that this piece of furniture sat outside the veil, not in the Holy of Holies, though that's where it's mentioned here. It's associated with that which is inside the veil, but it actually sat outside the veil. In Exodus 40, verse 5, we read, You shall also set the altar of gold uh, gold for the incense before the Ark of the Testimony, that's the Ark of the Covenant, right? And put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. That's the first veil as, as the priest came into the holy place. That would be the first door or entrance way. And what we see here is this description. If I backed up to verse 1 of Exodus 40, the description is give us, given us starting in the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, and it moves outward. So we see the... That, that this was to be set um, before the Ark of the Covenant, but with the second veil separating. Interesting. Associated with what's inside the Holy of Holies, but actually placed in the, in, in the ho- most holy place, or the, the holy place, if you will. Which makes sense because you change that stuff all the time. You wouldn't just sit there for a year, right? Yeah. You're always servicing. V- very practical. Yeah, it'd have to be available. <clears throat> Excellent point. Now, here in Hebrews, we see its location is shifted from that which is described in the Old Testament in, in the book of Exodus. It, 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 it's clearly pictured outside the veil, though associated with what's inside the veil. But here it's mentioned or described as being behind the veil in, in the holy place uh, it, itself. Why? Why? What's up with this? This is, this is a little detail that we might just blow over. We're going to come back to it. We'll get to it in a moment, what I, I, I believe and others believe uh, it's suggestive of. But in these three pieces of furniture, we see Jesus as the light of the world, as the, uh, the bread of life, and as our great intercessor, right? The, uh, the, the lampstand, the light of the world, uh, the table with the showbread, the bread of life. Uh, and, and then uh, the altar of incense uh, uh, as our, you know, he, he is at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us, our great intercessor. So in these pieces of furniture and in, in, in this er, the earthly tabernacle under the first covenant, we see these foreshadowings uh, of, of the person of Jesus Christ and, and many others than these. But now... In the Holy of Holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. The Ark itself is a picture uh, of Christ. In both his humanity, it was made of acacia wood, and his divinity, it was overlaid with gold. The, the wood, the acacia wood, speaks of the humanity of Christ, and the gold speaks of the divinity of Christ. He is the God-man, fully man and fully God at the same time. And it's prefigured or modeled or, or, or foreshadowed there in the, the construction of, uh, of the Ark of the Covenant. And inside it were three items. On the one hand, they're a reminder of man's failure. The manna in the, the pot, right? A reminder, a reminder of man's ungratefulness for God's provision. God referred to the manna as bread from heaven. Speaking of Christ, right? What did the Jews call it? Anybody know? What is it? What is it? Or that stuff. And they grew tired of it. They complained about it and, and what have you. So a reminder of man's ungratefulness for God's provision. Secondly, Aaron's rod that budded, which is a reminder of man's rebellion against God's authority. They weren't happy with Aaron being the priest. And from Aaron, his descendants uh, being the, 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 the you know, the uh, genealogy of, of, of the priest. And they, they all wanted to be priests themselves. And so the, that's what the, the whole rebellion of uh, uh, Korah was all about. And, and, and so, and, and after all that, the earth opening up and swallowing some of them and fire burning others up and, and everything, Moses finally said, look, enough, you know, go, uh, uh, each one of you bring a, 
a staff with the, the you know name of the tribe on it or you know and we'll set them before the lord here and and uh, whichever one buds that's you know we'll know you know who god's choice is and it was aaron's uh, rod that budded <clears throat> so a reminder of man's rebellion against god's authority and then finally the 10 commandments the reminder of man's failure to keep god's law so on the one hand, they're a reminder of, of man's failure. But on the other hand, they are a picture for us of Jesus. Go figure. <laughs> Re- remember, he stepped into our world as a man uh, to identify with this, right? But uh, we see him pictured as the bread of life, his resurrection. And think of it. Uh, Aaron walked around with that walking stick, that rod, for year after year after year. It was just a dead old stick. But there, before the presence of God, in this this test, if you will, what what who's your choice, God? Who's your man? Uh, th- that rod budded and bore fruit, it, 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 a picture of resurrection life, if you will. So we see the resurrection of Christ in it, a- a- and then we also know that that uh, we couldn't fulfill the law, so Christ had to fulfill it for us. So we we see uh, Christ as the one who fill, fulfills the law on our behalf. It's exciting stuff, don't you think? I mean, all the way back here in that old covenant, God is giving us peaks into the new covenant, that new thing he's going to do. Then there's the mercy seat uh, that sat on top, not taupe, got to change my notes, uh, on top of the ark. It, it was the place where the high priest placed the blood of atonement once a year. It was the place where God's glory dwelt between the cherubim. So the high priest ministered there once each year to atone for sin. Jesus offered himself up once, emphasis on once here, not once a year, but once for all. And so we see a a hint of that. And, And now when God looks down upon those who are in Christ, right, all these things were inside the Ark of the Covenant, which is a picture of Christ, uh, the, the reference or the, the inference being those who are in Christ, he doesn't see our failures, but looking through the atoning blood of Christ, the perfect sacrifice, he sees us through the righteousness of his sinless son. Wow. I don't know about you, but uh, some days I'm more acutely aware of my failures than other days, uh, you know, and, and, uh, Uh, bottom line is we blow it and we blow it and we blow it we aren't righteous and and if he didn't look at us through the righteousness of his son seeing us in the light of that imputed righteousness of his son we'd be toast but here it is foreshadowed or pictured uh, in the ministry of the high priest in the in the earthly tabernacle, all prefiguring the person of Christ and his work on our behalf. And then finally, let's touch on the shift in location of the altar of incense. It can be viewed in light of Jesus as our great intercessor. Uh, we know that the, the incense represented the prayer of the saints, but now we see that Christ is at the right hand of God where he ever lives to make intercession for us. When Jesus died, what happened to that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place? Split. It was torn in two from top to bottom. Who tore it? God. Torn in two by God, thus removing the wall of separation between those two compartments. Effectively, they became one, right? So on the one hand, we can think in terms of Jesus as our high priest ministering ministering on our behalf in the holy of holies, the place where God's presence dwells in in heaven itself, if you will. But isn't it also true that uh, with the tearing of the veil, we now have access? In fact, I heard Bruce mention it in prayer directly to the throne of grace. We can come boldly to that throne and pray. And how do we pray? We say those words in Jesus name, right? But what does that mean in the, the power and authority of Christ? So, we see in this the, the intercessory prayer of Jesus uh, mixed with the prayer of the saints. Uh, altogether true, 
uh, all together in the true tabernacle, not the earthly tabernacle. By the way, the earthly tabernacle, uh, as we've previously noted, there's one piece of furniture that's missing, right? That was a place for the priest to sit. No place for them to sit. They were, when they were in there, they were constantly working. There, there, there was work that always needed to be done. There was no rest from it, if you will. But what do we see Jesus in the true tabernacle doing? Sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, right? And so why is he sitting? Because his is a finished work. It's a work that, uh, it, it, he, he's, it's a symbol of his rest because it, it's finished. That, that work of atonement is a finished work. So, um, marvelous pictures. And then as we move on into uh, verses 6 through 10, we see uh, priestly service under the old covenant. Uh, verses 6 and 7 um, now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the ta tabernacle performing the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So in that first part of the tabernacle, the priest performed daily functions, such as tending to the the lampstand, uh, you know, the oil had to be uh, refilled and, and, and there were wicks that, you know, uh, burned in that oil and they had to be replaced. And, and so there was some maintenance that went on. Uh, they replaced the showbread each day and you know, removing the old loaves and putting the new loaves on and, and, and so forth. So they had uh, daily functions uh, that they performed there in that first part of the, the tabernacle. But as we've already noted, the, uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, if it's, as it's generally called today, uh, the high priest and only the high priest would enter that second compartment behind that veil, the, the Holy of Holies. And he went in not for fellowship, but to atone for sin. First for his own, and then for that of the people. Note it was for those sins of the people committed in ignorance. And it's been suggested that the daily ministrations of the sacrifices on the altar of sacrifice outside the, the, the tent itself and, and all of that, we're dealing with you know, known sin. You, you, you knew you blew it, and so you brought an offering to the priest and, you know, in order to you know, deal with it before God. But... But here on the Day of Atonement, he went in to deal with, with sins of ignorance or, 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 or unknown sin, if you, if you will. But Jesus' work as our high priest, his work on the cross was far greater. It was sufficient to atone for all of our sin. The sin we do in ignorance and the sin that we know of. And then we're given further light from the Holy Spirit with respect to the priestly service under the Old Covenant, verses 8 through 10. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time. There, there's that idea again it, that it's symbolic. These things will foreshadow greater truths. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. So while the earthly tabernacle and later the temple uh, stood... Uh, the, the, the way into the holiest of all, uh, when they stood, the way to the holiest of all was not manifested. It wasn't made clear. It, it, it hadn't been fully provided. In other words, the old had to pass away before the new could be fully revealed or fully appreciated. He reaffirms for us uh, that these things were symbolic. The Greek word here for symbol or, uh, uh, or symbolic is the Greek word uh, parabola. 
That is, they were models representing or suggestive of greater truths. Uh, specifically told that. So we're not stretching by drawing these conclusions. So the tabernacle itself and all the regulations for worship under the Old Covenant were a parable, so to speak, of greater truths found in the New Covenant. All the way back there in the Old Covenant. They foreshadowed. Uh, the priestly service performed at the time that the, the book of Hebrews was written, which was before the destruction of the temple, could not even make the priests that were offering them clean with regard to the conscience. And if it was incomplete for the priest, how much less complete for those on whose behalf they labored or offered those sacrifices. The weakness under the priestly service seen in that old covenant was its inability to address man's need for transformation of the heart, in the heart, the inner man, if you will, and was imposed only, uh, uh, that old covenant was imposed only until the time of the Reformation, unless we be confused because we speak of, you know, the, the Protestant Reformation, uh, you know, the end, uh, the, the the division from the Catholic Church. That's not the Reformation that's speak, being spoken of here. It's talking about when Jesus said new wine it must be in new wineskins. It's that new covenant. That uh, the, the old was there until Jesus came and instituted the new. And then the last part uh, of this chapter, uh, which we'll move through briefly, um, not sure it needs a lot of detail, though we might come back when we look, if we look at more details of the, the tabernacle, uh, we might look at the sacrificial system. You know, each one of those Old Testament sacrifices, the sin offering, the burnt offering, the meal offering, the, all of those, uh, the, the five major offerings, uh, in some way picture a different facet of Christ. So we might look at some of the significance of those in a, a brief way. We might not, but... Uh, I'm, I'm still praying about that, but um, let me see here. So, features of the new covenant are described in the second part, the, the superior sanctuary of the new covenant, verse uh, uh, 11. But Christ came as high priest of good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So Christ, as our high priest, is ministering now in a greater or more perfect sanctuary. That is the very throne room of God, a sanctuary that's divine. It's not made with hands. It's not part of this earthly creation. Uh, he goes on and speaks of the uh, superior sacrifice of Christ uh, for the new covenant, verses 12 through 15. Not with the blood of goats and calves. But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the inter eternal inheritance. So, uh, the blood of these animals was sufficient to cover sin temporarily, on a temporary basis. But only a perfect sacrifice could obtain eternal redemption. That's the, the point he's making uh, for man. Uh, and the sacrifice of Christ was the superior in fact, the perfect sacrifice. It was superior uh, in that it was perfect. You know, uh, uh, the value of the life of an animal certainly doesn't compare to the value of a life of a man, right? So, um, uh, they, the, the blood of those animals covered over sin for, for a while, but it, it was that perfect sacrifice, Christ dying in our place as a man, but sinless uh, that made the superior sacrifice. And uh, so it was perfect. It was voluntary and it was motivated by love. Can't get better than that. Can you? I, I, I love that. I, you know, I shouldn't probably mention this on tape, but in, it's one of those things that you see the Harry Potter series uh, uh, 
which I know a lot of Christians don't watch or have problems with, it's amazing that the deepest magic uh, in that series is love. The boy that survived the curse survived because of love and the sacrifice of another. You see all these little hints throughout that of, of spiritual truths, whether intended by the author or not, they're there. And I think it's because they're a basic part of our understanding, if you will, of the world. Though we deny it, the, the unsaved, unregenerate man denies these things, yet it's such an, it, it, a, a part of his, who he is that he can't escape him. And you, you see that emerge in funny places in literature in funny ways. So just, just interesting that, uh, you know, it was a perfect sacrifice, it was voluntary, and it was motivated by love. Now, if the blood of these animals, though being an imperfect sacrifice, reviewed or received, if you will, by Israel as sufficient, God told them, do this, and we'll deal with your sin problem for now. And, and they said, okay, we'll do that because we need, they saw it as sufficient. How much more sufficient should they have viewed the ultimate sacrifice or the ultimate sufficiency of the perfect sacrifice that was offered by Jesus, their Messiah. They didn't see that, but they should have. Now the ashes of uh, a heifer here refers to, refers to the ashes of the red heifer, which were used to make the, the, the holy water that was used or, or suitable for ceremonial cleaning. And because they wanna rebuild the temple one day, they need to cleanse everything. So they had been searching for uh, a red heifer that, you know, without any blemish or anything so that they could uh, get these ashes and make the holy water and cleanse things. And rumor has it that they've done this now and, and what have you, they, they've, you know, raised a red heifer and, and have those ashes and, and everything. At any rate, you can read about that uh, in Numbers 19. But here's the point for you and I, we no longer need holy water, at least in that literal sense of water to, you know, sprinkle or ceremonial, uh, you know, for ceremonial cleaning. Uh, what we do need the washing of the water by the word, right? Water being symbolic uh, of the word of God. And remember uh, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet and Peter said, you know, you'll never wash my feet. And, and, and uh, uh, Jesus said to Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And he, Peter says, give me a shower, you know, start at the head and work down, just get, get all of it. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. You're already clean, it's just your feet. You know, the feet are where we make contact with this world and, and, and the, the dirt of this world gets stuck to us, if you will, and needs to be clean, cleaned away. And so we need that washing of the word on a daily basis to, to, to uh, you know, sort of take away or, or, or remove, help us to see where we're stained or contaminated. And, and, and you know, so that we, uh, you, you could tie this to First John 1, 9, you know, if we uh, confess our faults, He's faithful and just to cleanse us of our faults, right? And, and so that's that's kind of the idea here. Now, uh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of Christ is sufficient not to just cleanse our sin, but even our conscience. That's a big deal, isn't it? Interestingly enough, we read in scripture that our consciences can be uh, uh, seared, 1 Timothy 4.2. Our conscience can be defiled, uh, Titus 1.15. And our conscience can be evil, according to Hebrews 10 verse 22. We'll get to that uh, maybe next week, probably the week after. Now, the blood of Christ is sufficient to cleanse our, our conscience from dead works. Uh, sin is in general view here, but the empty continuation of the old covenant sacrifices, which foreshadowed the sacrifice of, uh, sacrifice of Christ, is, is probably the, the better way to see this. Um, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of his substitutionary death. And his current ministry as our mediator looks back to the cross and his perfect sacrifice and finished work. It, it, it's uh, uh, for the redemption of the transgressions un, under the 
the the first law uh, uh, again is 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 current ministry for us has nothing to do with atonement that's a finished work but with uh you know uh, dealing with with uh um you know uh, our our defense against the accuser of the brethren and and our spiritual victory if you will and the re- redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant the sacrifice under the old covenant were in essence an IOU now paid in full by Christ in a sacrifice at the cross. And the necessity of, of Jesus' death in verses 16 through 22. For uh, where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of, a, of the testator. For the testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Likewise, he sprinkled the blood both, uh, with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission." So a testament, or we sometimes call a covenant, like a last will and testament, doesn't take a, a, a effect until the, the a person, the testator, if you will, dies. So Jesus had to die in order for the new covenant to be put into effect. Now a testament differs from a covenant in this way. A testament is dictated by one person. I've got things I want done, stuff that I, I want distributed upon people I care about, I dictate that, right? That's what a a last will and testament is all about. So a a testament is dictated by one person, not negotiated by two parties or or, or two or or more like a contract. No haggling back and forth. Uh, That new covenant is, uh, that new testament, if you will, uh, it it was all Jesus. And uh, now, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So when you think about that old covenant, the, the, the sacrificial system under the Levitical priesthood in, in uh, Judaism, uh, almost every part or aspect of that whole system was touched in one way or another by blood. And that's an important principle that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sin. Time, you know, if we just wait long enough, that'll do away with sin? Uh Uh-uh. Good works? Nope. Uh, But look, I've lived uh, as a decent person all my life. Nope, that won't deal with with those sins. Well, certainly if I die, when I die, my sins are done away with. No. Not even our own death will bring about the forgiveness of sins. Only the blood of a perfect and acceptable sacrifice can do that. And that's what Christ did for us. And then we close with the perfect sanctuary, uh, uh, receiving the perfect sacrifice. Uh, verse 23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places, made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages. I like that phrase, by the way, the end of the ages, from from the, the, the cross until now, we're in the last age. Yeah, maybe it's gone on for a couple thousand years, but it's the last age. That, that means he, he's coming again soon. How soon? I don't know, but he's coming again, and it's soon. We're in that last age. So uh, uh, now, let's uh, see, uh, where was I? The um, He appeared. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for the right verse. Not... I 
think I scrolled too far here. <clears throat> now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as thy priest enters the holy place uh, every year with the blood of another. He would then have to, had to suffer the uh, often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, uh, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. <clears throat> And is, uh, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So the copies of the earthly sanctuary were uh, purified with, with imperfect sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves could only be purified with that perfect offering, with the perfect sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice was here on earth, but it is the basis of his com continuing work as our, our mediator and high priest in heaven. That continuing work is not in the sense of atonement, as I said a few minutes ago. There, there's no need for him to repeatedly offer himself. That atonement is a finished work. But... The, the, that, that ongoing work is the sense, in the sense of uh, as, as an intercessor for us to defend us from our accuser. Who's our accuser? The devil, right? Um, uh, and, and this uh, appointed unto man, it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. The, the main point being that there is no need for his repeated sacrifice. Once for all was enough. A man dies once, right? That's, that's what's being said. So how many times did he need to die for this man? Once. Uh, and it was sufficient because of who he was to die for all men once. Uh, uh, so that's the main point, uh, you know, that it's a finished work, uh, if you will. But this clearly eliminates the idea of reincarnation, doesn't it? Man dies once. It's appointed unto man to die once. Now, there are some exceptions, right? Lazarus died twice and... You know, we could go through a few exceptions, but in the general sense, appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. Um, and then finally, uh, we see that just great encouragement for us. He's coming again for those who eagerly await him. Do you think the whole church is eagerly awaiting him? Probably not. I hope oh. we're those that are eagerly awaiting him, right? Uh, you know, sometimes... Uh, we in the church get our priorities messed up, don't we? Um, would be to God that he uh, reminds us that uh, there's a crown promise for those who are watching for his coming, uh, who, who love his coming, and uh, clearly, as it's seen here, are eager, eagerly awaiting his coming. Lord, we thank you for just an incredible chapter. Um, so much more we could talk about. Uh, help us to to know uh, how to pursue further study in this, uh, either personally or whether we should do that uh, in some sense collectively here uh, next time. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.